What if you woke up one day and you had lost half your machining knowledge? Well, what happened if the day after that, you lost a bit more knowledge? And the day after that, and the day after that, all of a sudden you might be in a position where you can't do your job. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machining Tool, back here again for Practical Machinists. Now this sounds like a scary situation, but this is exactly the risk we're facing as an industry if we don't do something about it. And on this episode of Machine Shop Talk, we're gonna be diving into why skill loss is such a huge risk for our industry and some strategies we may be able to put in place to mitigate it. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about something that may be familiar to a lot of you, but I think it's worth talking about, even if you're thinking about this yourself, because it's something that is affecting us as an industry, and it is a real threat. As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, this is about skill loss, and what happens when institutional knowledge and historical knowledge starts to leave the trade, your shop, your region, whatever it may be. So I'd like to take my shop, Lakewood Machine and Tool, as an example of this, because I think it's a pretty good template for what can happen if you're not careful. Back in the day, as I mentioned probably a million times before, Lakewood Machine and Tool used to be a tool and die shop. We built samping tooling for the, predominantly the office furniture industry. So we would do a lot of stuff for like the stamp steel sides or fronts of filing cabinets or you know, a bracket that would go in the bottom of a desk. We did a lot of this stuff and there were a lot of these companies around. We had a lot of very, very skilled machinists here and with nothing but, you know, machinists and tool makers and with nothing but, you know, manual mills, manual grinders, you know, radial arm drill press, manual tooling, they, will, they were able to produce highly accurate, very precision, tight tolerant stamping dies that would stamp out hundreds of thousands of parts for our customers at their facilities. Now, as I'm sure a lot of you know who have been in the trade for a little while, a few things happened over the years. You know, if that was back in 88 when we started. First, this little thing called the internet and computers and email came into existence. So all of a sudden, you know, people don't buy a million filing cabinets for their big office buildings anymore. So that part of the industry went down. Um, the open office plan came, so there weren't, you know, cubicles and stuff anymore. We did a lot of stuff for those, so that went away. You also add on top of that, that at this point, you know, once you hit 95, 96, moving into 2000, it became cheaper for our customers to spend $50,000 on a die from China, then spend another $50,000 here fixing that die to actually make it work than it would be for them to buy a die from us. This is also when CNC came around. So all of a sudden there was a big pivot in the industry. I mean, CNC has been around for longer than that, but that's when it really started getting widely adopted. So you had these things kind of really twisting where our place was in the industry. So at this point we did start to pivot towards CNC. You know, a few of our office furniture customers, they needed the drawer pulls for their desks milled. So we bought a couple CNC mills we were one of the first ones around to do it. So we were milling those, you know, four at a time. It was working well. And then we started to take on more and more CNC work. But that die work really started to go away. So instead of doing building dies all the time and that being our main bread and butter, we would repair dies, but we were doing CNC machining. So we'd do replacement punches. We'd do replacement die sections. We had a big die maintenance program. Then that started to go down as well because these people start to move towards CNC punch presses and forming. So you don't need a giant stamping tool for all this stuff anymore. So our tool making ability started to go down. Our last real tool, tool maker at one point retired and we still had the guy under him who was training. And he didn't know as much as the 40 year tool maker, but he was okay. So he could do die maintenance. So we kept maintaining the dies we had, that was fine. Then he moved away and that was fine because, well, we didn't really have die work anymore. So while we could still do, you know, replacement punches, I mean, I'm capable of doing replacement punches and stuff, 
we lost the ability to not only service dies, but build dies. So this is something that was a skill set that our shop was essentially based on. You know, when we started, we were based on doing tool and die. And over the years, we completely lost the ability to do that. You know, now we do have a tool maker here again who's very skilled, so we could do it. But for a good chunk of 10 years there, if a customer had come to us and said, hey, we want to build a, you know, eight hit die, can you do it? We would have to say, no, we, we don't have that institutional knowledge here anymore. Those people all left. You know, there's certain skills I want to point out that when we're talking about this, arguably may not be worth keeping. That sounds bad and that's not really what I'm what I mean, but you know, it's important that somebody in the world knows how to run a shaper. At the end of the day, do I think every shop out there knows how to run a shaper? Probably not. It's not an effective tool. You know, there are new tools that replace it. You need to be up on modern technology. But there are certain skills that you need to make sure you're keeping at your shop. Now let's take a big step back and look at this from the industry. Where else do you see this happening? I mean, personally, I see it in a lot of the manual Mr. Fix-It type shops. You know, here in Newmarket, we used to have a ton of little one-man shows, two-man shows, three-man shows, where all they did was repair work. So, you know, they'd be the guy that if a factory had a part that was down and they needed it fixed that day, they'd slap it on a manual and get it fixed. Those people are retiring. I know three of them around here, including one of my neighbors, who have shut down in the last three years. You know, or look at my own shop. Again, we used to run Mastercam, old, old Mastercam back in the day before we got onto the new stuff. When we were old Mastercam, at one point we had five guys here total working, and all five of them knew how to program very well. Now we're 10 people, and there's still only five people here that know how to program really, really well. This is a little different because, you know, obviously I've talked about this before. There isn't that pool of skilled people anymore to pull from. You know, there's not people just waiting for a job who have 10 years of experience. So the reason why we only have half of our guys fully trained up to program is because we're training new people. We're bringing people from the outside into the trade, training them up. But you have to be careful. What if, you know, a couple of the people move away? Now we have two people who know how to program really well and eight who don't. And what if that went to one? What if that went to zero? Probably not gonna happen, but you need to make sure this knowledge is getting transferred as quickly and as effectively as possible. You know, I'm not just talking about apprenticeship. I'm not just talking about training. I'm talking about transferring the historical institutional knowledge from that 40-year-old tool maker to the next generation. You know, if you trained under somebody who has 40 years of experience, they have 40 years of tips and tricks, things they've learned, best practices, that you're just not gonna get from somebody if you're training under who has only been in the trade for 10 years. That 10-year machinist may be great, but they don't have that dearth of knowledge that some of the you know, more experienced people in the trade have. And as we're seeing you know, kind of the last of this generation of long-term tool makers, the big you know, cohort of them retire, it's a big risk. So what we need to do, I propose, as an industry is not only focus on training and getting people into the trade, but we need to actually have a plan for transferring as much of that knowledge in the next few years as we can. Because, you know, this isn't going to wait forever. People are getting older, people are retiring. I know here at Lakewood, this is something we've talked about for a long time, but if your shop's like mine, it was kind of a, this is a nice to do thing if you have time. We're really taking the steps now to take some of our more experienced people and, you know, pair them directly with someone in almost a job shadowing apprenticeship for as much as we can to transfer as much of that knowledge as possible. You know, globally, if we don't do this, especially in the West, we may lose the ability to make certain things. You know, you hear about certain industries where a plant shuts down, everybody who worked there goes away. All of a sudden, if they want to build that part or build that machine, they could probably figure it out, but they're starting from zero. You know, a part is a part is a part until it's not. You lose that dedicated knowledge in that arena and we may actually lose the ability to make things. And even if we don't lose the ability to make them, we may lose the ability to be competitive at all. So this is really, really important and I hope you guys feel it is as well. I don't know specifically how we transfer this knowledge and this is where I'd like the help from you guys. I'd like to know in the comments below, 
What's the best way to transfer this knowledge? What should we be talking about as an industry? Is it, you know, adopting the European style of apprenticeship where people come and they are an institutional, I like that word, this video, I guess, institutional. But they're an institutional person at your company. You know, you have a cohort of 10 of them at a big shop and they work there for four years as an apprentice, then they're guaranteed a job. That's, you know, the German style. Do we, you know, try to catalog as much of this information as possible on video? Is that effective? Um, you know, we need all the ideas we can get. So I'd like to know in the comments below what you guys think we could do about this. And in any case, guys, thank you very much for watching. Make sure you turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thanks again for watching, guys. You take care.